thanks everybody for hanging out, for being here. Uh, we're here with Lydia Liebman, and she's going to talk about uh, her job as a um, publicist and promoter. Uh, and, um, and then we'll be able to ask her some questions as well, which I think has been the fun part with all of this. Uh, so let me just say a little, about, a little bit about Lydia. Uh, little, Lydia Liebman Promotions is a boutique public relations agency and consulting firm based in New York City. Uh, since 2010, Lydia Liebman Promotions has worked with a robust roster of musical artists and entertainers, educational and cultural institutions, record labels, nonprofits, and production companies to captivate and engage audiences while bringing awareness to America's greatest art form and its musical cousins. Um, whether servicing a new release to international press and radio or filling seats in a world-class venue, LLP has a proven track record of fulfilling the unique communication needs of the music industry through innovation and modern campaigns. Originally geared toward up and coming musicians at Berklee College of Music, which is when Lydia and I met when we were in Boston, LLP has stayed true to its roots and it's proud to have collaborated with hundreds of individual artists with an emphasis on those that are re releasing albums independently or on boutique record labels. LLP has promoted releases on Sunnyside, Ears and Eyes Records, New Focus Recordings, Residence, uh, excuse me, Residence Rec Records, Revive Music, Wool Gathering Records, and Holistic Music Works, among others. Our tireless dedication cu coupled with our clients' outstanding artistry has allowed many of our represented projects to break into the top 10 on the Billboard and iTunes jazz charts, as well as peak in the top five on the Jazz Week radio chart. So uh, Lydia's done a lot in a small amount of time, which is pretty impressive. Thanks for reading my copy like that, Andrew. I haven't heard my copy about my company <laughs> in like, I don't, I don't think, wow, it's been a while. I, I thank you for reading that whole thing. I, I was thinking like, this is a tongue twister, but it's so well written as well. I just should have practiced wow. earlier. No, the funny thing <laughs> is that I had a, I have a good friend from college who is a, was a marketing student, not in music or jazz at all. And he um, helped me write that, but I was uh, like a senior and um, I haven't tweaked it since, but you know what? It holds up. Okay. So it um, holds up. Yeah. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. It's great, man. Nice. I'll, I'll, I, there he is. Hey, Ian, how are you, man? Good. Sorry I'm late. That's all right. I'm <laughs> glad you're here. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, some of Lydia's clients, I just want to list some of them off. And if you don't know any of these, please go to her website, check out these incredible artists. Um, I basically wrote down the ones that I do know, and I'll be checking out the ones that I don't. Uh, some of Lydia's clients, past and present, include Jorge Perez Albela, which actually hung out with us last week, which is great to have him. Uh, John Minock, who's here with us today. Uh, Dave Liebman, who is obviously here with us today. Hey, Dave, thank you for being here. Uh, both of you, appreciate it. Uh, Mehmet Ali San Sanlikol, is that right? Great. Very close. <laughs> Very close. Uh, Julian Shore, Tomoko Amuro, uh, the Brecker brothers, Michael Alatuja, uh, Carolina Calvace, Jonathan Barber, Andy Milne, uh, Chris McCarthy, Rachel Tarian, uh, Laila Biali, Sam Hirsch, Aubrey Johnson, Donna Alexa, Lakeisha Benjamin, Ralph Peterson, Darren Barrett, Warren Evans, Brian Lynch, Emma Frank, Ben Wolf, Wallace Roney, and the list just goes on and on. So I won't give you more than that. It's a <laughs> lot and it's really impressive. Um, so that says a lot about you. Thanks, Andrew. So it's, it's all you, my friend. Well, thank you so much um, for having me. And thank you again for that, the intro and everything. Um, really appreciate um, you, know, you reaching out to me about this and I, am, uh, I hope that it'll be useful. Um, so I think that probably the best way, um, you know, since we are like kind of a small group, um, is I feel like it's probably this discussion would be best um, had as, you know, an open chat between everybody. And um, I really, 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 really do encourage you to ask questions. Um, I think that, you know, it should be like a flowing conversation kind of about, you know, what PR means, what it can do for you and kind of um, where we are now with everything that's been going on in the past couple months, which is to say the least, like a shit show more or less. So we can kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, but uh, yeah, so to come off of um, a little bit of what Andrew said, so um, I've been doing PR for about, um, in one in one way or another, um, for like, like, 
it, it's 10 years, which makes me feel very old. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, though. It's from 2010 when I started in college. And um, since then, you know, it's evolved and, and what I've done has shifted focus and everything. But um, I've been in New York since 2014. And it's around that time, too, that I've been doing pretty much um, the vast majority of my work are, is PR campaigns for new releases. Um, so new albums that are coming out and um, working with artists on a project by project basis in most cases. And of course, um, that also includes like tour support and you know things that come up along the way like singles and, and things like that but generally speaking though we're dealing with full-length album uh, releases so um basically what a publicist does is um gets the word out you know about your project we are the the connector between um you and the press so we are communicating with them on a regular basis about um new releases new things coming up we're communicating with them to obviously raise awareness and in order to, to do that, you know, to, to place features and um, interviews and reviews and, and all those little things that help, um, you know, that are considered publicity for an artist. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with magazines like Downbeat and Jazz Times and Jazz Is. We're also dealing with blogs like Stereo Gum and Bandcamp Daily. You know, we're also dealing with um, smaller, you know, independent blogs or writers that um, maybe have like their own, you know, independent um, writing forums and stuff like that. And um, we're trying to basically cover the whole swath of jazz writers. So we're dealing with people in the U.S., but um, my office particularly deals also really heavily in the U.K. I have um, my operations manager is based in London, so we're doing a lot of outreach in the U.K. market as well and, and a lot of the European magazines and outlets there. Um, we also do a lot of work in South America and Latin America. Uh, my husband is, um, is a Latin drummer, um, and he um, uses his expertise being around this business for a while to help me in that regard. So we do a lot of outreach in Spanish and things like that too. Um, and then we also, you know, are pitching out to Australia and Japan and, you know, basically like anywhere where there's a presence of jazz. Um, a lot of the projects I work, pretty much everything's rooted in like the jazz tree, but a lot of the projects that I work um, are a little bit more, you know, kind of come off of the are, are not necessarily straight ahead so for instance like on this on this chat john minnick is here and um you know john's project is really interesting because it is a cross between you know a very hard-hitting jazz project but there's also some elements of you know a little bit of cabaret things and there's a little bit of you know there's some nice singer songwriter elements and you know there's a lot of different different parts that go into this project and um some publicists that work in jazz might look at this and be like oh my god i don't want to touch this it's like too there's it's it's, it's just too out out for me um but for me i find that to be great because the more opportunity we have to get coverage the better so and i think that if we have like a multi-genre project or there's a lot of different hooks it's really good for me so a lot of my projects kind of fall in that rain where um sorry that vein where they're jazz but jazz plus or jazz and um or you know on the uh or just another form of creative music. Um, so obviously right now we have had a very complicated couple, three months because <laughs> the world has exploded. So um, <laughs> it's been very difficult. Um, and uh, I, I guess before, I, what I'd like to do is, is I guess start off if anybody has any leading questions or anything in particular that they want to talk about on this um, before I go into a spiel. Um, but I will say that the last three months has changed things quite a bit, um, just in general. Um, there's obviously no concerts and no tours, and that has really uh, had an impact on a lot of people's campaigns, and it's had an impact on the way that we go about press. Um, in addition to what we are dealing with as artists and musicians, um, journalists and media publications are also dealing with their own repercussions of what's happening, um, where they're getting laid off and they are closing down and you know, freelance budgets are being slashed, which has also had an impact on how we are going about our jobs. So it's been really crazy. Um, we are uh, busy though, which is great. And um, we've been able to kind of make it work for us. And um, I'm you know, happy to share how we've been doing that 
um, but I guess to, to lead off, if there's anything in particular that you know you want me to start with, or any particular questions anyone has going into this, um, that would be helpful. Then we can kind of like you know take it from there. If not, I'll just keep talking. But uh, <laughs> I see, I see, you have our, our man in the blue has a question. Yes. Yeah, my friend. What do you? What, what's your question? Uh, how are you working in this environment in light of you know the pandemic and being in place? Like, what are you doing? Because like you just said, yeah. you know. No press, no campaigns, you know, what are you doing? Yeah, so what we've been doing is um, we have been focusing really heavily um, on our, you know, on our, the new releases that we're working. So to give you kind of like an overview of when all this hit in March, um, when this started, when, when the lockdown started in New York in like March 13th or whenever that was, you know, around that week, um, <laughs> March was like one of the busiest months I think I've ever had. I had five releases coming out mm -hmm. on March 27th, which is, a lot and um, is more than it should be, but there was a lot of things that bottlenecked and caused there to be like uh, 10 releases in a month. And so the middle of all this, you know, I was in the middle of a lot of campaigns. I was in the middle of ones, you know, that were about to release. I had some projects, um, like I was working um, JD Walter's new project, um, Andrea Brockfeld's project, a bunch of projects that came out early in the year. So there, by the time you get into March, you know, they're starting to kind of kind of wind down a little. So, you know, we had those and then we were launching all these projects. Like Lakeisha Benjamin was one of them. Okay. Tana Alexa, Lila Bialy. <laughs> like these are three major projects, Rachel Tarian and the Chicago Yes Tet. I mean, these are five projects that are massive, especially Lakeisha's. I mean, I'm sure you've seen Lakeisha all over the place, which thank God, um, but like <laughs> a massive undertaking. So this is, these are not like, you know, you can't, you can't fuck these up. Okay. So, so we had to kind of be like, what are we going to do? Um, so when this happened, we instantly had to like recalibrate everything. Um, we had no tours on the table. So suddenly all of our, our attention was, was basically paid to like this new album coming out and convincing people to just write about the album alone, um, without having that tour component. So it was, um, it was a bit difficult. Um, as well, because we also didn't really know what was going to happen with, you know, streaming and things like that. Now everyone's streaming all the time. Like we're streaming constantly. Hello. Like we are all streaming and it's like the norm. But in March, we didn't know if that was going to be the norm. I mean, we assumed that that was what's going to happen, but like I didn't know and no one knew. Hmm. So the first thing I did was I had sent out a notice to my press list, which is about 500, 600 people. And I said, Hey guys, we're in an unprecedented situation. This is like the zillion of releases, <laughs> the, the giant catalog of releases that we have coming in the next three months. Um, we are in uncharted territory. A lot of these artists are gonna be doing concerts online. They're gonna be streaming. I need you as the press to take this seriously and treat mm. these like real shows. And that was kind of like my plea to them to be like, please let's make this like, you know, the real deal. Um, and I didn't know what they were gonna say. I mean. I, I wasn't sure if, you know, I, I like wrote to everybody, like NPR, Wall Street Journal, you know, all the jazz publications, Rolling Stone. I mean, they, they I wasn't sure if they were going to say like, well, like this is, no one wants to watch something shitty on their screen. So, you know, with bad reception and bad sound. And so, no. Or are they going to be like, oh no, this is great. Let's do it. I was really impressed that pretty much they all jumped on immediately and were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let us know what you've got. Let's get it moving. Um, so one of the first things that I did is I, was working with Tana Lex at the time. Um, Tana um, with Owen Broder and Sarin Chip created Live from Our Living Rooms. And right. this was that, mm. you know, which I'm sure a lot of you might've seen about that. Um, my dad was part of that. Mm. You know, we had a lot of artists be part of that. That went amazingly well. We got Rolling Stone, we got Financial Times, we got the Wall Street Journal, we got everybody I pitched pretty much got on board to cover it. And I was like, oh my God, okay, this is really a good sign. So that was the first thing we did was just sort of recalibrate and pivot to streaming ASAP while also, you know, really, really focusing on the new releases and being, you know, and really also trying to sort of in a way, you know, say to press, like, this is all they have right now. Like, like guys, there's no shows, you know, <laughs> there is no concerts, there's no tours. The only thing that a lot of artists are going to have that's new is going to be press. So like, give it to me as a favor, <laughs> you know, ki kind of basically to be like, please be nice and give me something because they got nothing else. Like you are their only hope. And I know that's dramatic, but it's kind of true because like, what yeah. else is there? So that was sort of the way that I went into it and how I framed it. 
Um, and that being said, I had a release schedule, you know, full in March, full in April, full in May, and none of my artists changed their dates. So we have been working the schedule as it was planned, you know, from the beginning. Um, and that's how we've been kind of dealing with it. And it hasn't been, you know, super easy. I have the, the biggest problem I've had is that the major publications laid off a lot of folks. So Ooh. when Billboard, you know, when the Hollywood Reporter Billboard group, you know, lays off a third of their staff, that is a problem for us because who am I pitching to? <laughs> I mean, when Afropunk lays off the contributors that I used to work with every day, that's a problem. Um, and that's been happening. So that has been the biggest challenge. <laughs> Luckily, jazz is niche enough <laughs> that we don't have to <laughs> deal with a lot of mainstream publications too much. But uh, those that do have that broad appeal, that is where I've had a little bit of trouble. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been making do. So that's kind of the the short, believe it or not, the short answer of how we've navigated this since the beginning. And we basically have been um, just applying that ethos going forward. And here we are in, in June, you know, about three months later and it's been okay so far. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. You, maybe they would be interested because I was definitely, I didn't know the release schedule. Like what is the ideal time for an artist to release what? And then is there another juncture a month later? You know, what's the deal on the gun? getting it out the door? Well, it used to be pre-COVID. Um, I, well, actually, even, even before pre-COVID, I would say, I, 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 I used to be um, under the impression that summer was not a great time to release. And it used to be that summer was a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a deader time. Um, from a press perspective, summer releases were difficult because with the festivals happening and, you know, there's so much opportunity for live events to be covered. So if you have an artist who's an indie, like a lot of the ones I work with, where they don't necessarily have representation to be booking a, a full tour um, and they are, you know, they have their one gig, at maybe in New York or wherever, um, and that's it, you are really running into a problem in the summer because, you know, pe people are covering Newport and the Canadian festivals and, you know, they're busy. Um, obviously, this year, we don't have any of that. So uh, that couples with the fact that the Grammys have consistently been moving up their deadline. Um, the Grammy deadline used to be the end of September and it is now the end of August. It was last year and it is this year again dictates um, a lot of people want to get their releases out before that deadline. So now summer is kind of fair game. Um, I used to say don't release in the summer because it's a bad time, but now I don't know. I think that you really can't go wrong when you release as long as you plan it um, properly with the right lead time. The only time that I discourage releasing is in December because of the holidays. So I, pretty much my blackout period is Thanksgiving through the first week of January. Um, and that's because, you know, Christmas and Hanukkah and all that stuff. But also because in January, you've got a lot of critics that are um, scrounging to get done their end of year list. And they have to turn in their best of for the year. And a lot of their attention is working on that list. Either it's the Francis Davis poll for NPR or whatever it is. You know, all the publications now have, you know, are suddenly experts and have their, their best 10 public, you know, albums of the year. So they got to get that done. So that's what we run into sometimes in January. And then, of course, in our world, we've got Jazz Congress and we've got APAP and we've got Winter Jazz Fest and all that stuff happening early January. So that also sucks up a lot of attention. So there's like that six week period, basically, um, the end of November to the beginning of January, which is probably not the best time unless you're doing a holiday record. And I did do a holiday record last year that I was so pleased with how well it went. Um, it was uh, Martina De Silva and Dan Shemilinski, um, the Shimmy Tina uh, Christmas special project on Outside of Music that came out, and it was amazing. It got a ton of reviews. I was so happy. Um, but if it didn't get any reviews, like, you lose it after the, you have three weeks to get your press at, for, for Christmas, and that's it. So that's kind of my, um, my, the only bad time. Otherwise, you can release at any time, as long as you give good enough lead time for someone like me to do my job, which is about three to four months. Three to four months. That's yeah. Just a yeah. And to that end, because I think it's people are always interested, like the biggest um, problem that I find um, for people that when they approach me for projects is they don't give me enough time. They'll, you know, send me an email. Let's say they send, they send me an email today and they'll be like, hey, I'm releasing a project in, you know, I'm releasing a project next month. Like, can we work on a campaign together? Like, probably, I mean, I'm, no, like I'm going to have to say no, <laughs> unless it's someone incredible and amazing. And 
it's a project that I really want to work or someone who's like already famous, in which case you don't have to do a lot of prep. But um, that is the biggest problem. We need a good three months, ideally like even four months ahead of the street date to do our jobs as publicists because we are sending out press releases, we're sending out promo CDs, um, you know, at least 10 weeks before the album actually comes out. So that is really the, what, I, what I'm saying about lead time, that's what, I'm, what I mean by that. I have a question about that. Yeah. Uh, what, to save you lead time, what would be the most efficient way for an artist to spend their time uh, before they come to you to get whatever they need to get together so that when they bring a project to you, uh, it's like turnkey, like all you need to do is do whatever you need to do to, to promote it or do your PR stuff. Good question. Um, so as when we take on our projects, we provide everybody with um, a press release and a one sheet that we create, we write it in house, unless you know, some artists have a finished up press release and they'll give it to us. But most of the time we're writing it. So in order for me to be able to do that efficiently, I need to have the liner notes or the album bio or the written material on the project ready to go. Um, I and my team, which is um, four of us in total, work you know, kind of divvy up who's writing what. And the thing that takes the most amount of time is writing those press releases. So if an artist comes to me and even if they've got like their form, you know, three or four months ahead and they're like, okay, this is what I want to do. Um, and they have like nothing written, you know, it's on them to quickly get it together. And sometimes they'll hire someone to write their liner notes or they want to hire someone to write the liner notes. So if you're going to hire someone, they need to have ample time to write it. So these are all things that, you know, you have to start thinking about well in advance. For me, I say that four months is like the sweet spot, meaning that if you're giving me four months ahead of the street date, um, that first month is me being able to write the material, that the, the second month is us prepping to send out the material, the third month is me sending the CDs, and then the fourth month is out, you know, if you look at it that way. Um, so having written material, um, it helps if you have your cover and your art taken care of. Um, it helps to have like your photos. I mean, it just, it helps to have your assets like ready to go. Um, but really above all, I need to have those mastered files, like the, the audio files ready to go so that when we send our blast, we can send it out. And lately the turnaround time, I think because of what's been happening has been tight. So I've been getting a lot of people working on them. They can't get their things, you know, they're not getting mixed uh, as fast as they wanted. The mastering's taking longer. And and then we're kind of like running up against it. We're like, I'm ready to send a blast, but I don't even have my masters yet. So it's important to have those assets ahead of time. Um, but the written material is probably the biggest thing because it takes me time to turn that around. Lydia, what do you ask from artists as far as actual um, copies, copies of CDs? Do you have a number that you ask them to send you? I stick with 90 as my general um, promo copy uh, amount. Um, I end up sending probably like about 75 and I keep, you know, a um, handful on for requests and stuff. Um, radio is different. Radio, they need a lot more because they still mostly need physical copies. Mm -hmm. um, the COVID thing has made it a little bit less. I, I've had a few journalists tell me that they, you know, originally because they were like afraid of, you know, like COVID traveling and yeah. sexual cases. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> cool. I, I, <laughs> there was one critic who was nervous about it and I actually sent him a photo of me with my Clorox wipes, like with the, <laughs> with the seat to, to prove that it was like a sterile environment, you know, ridiculous. Um, hopefully he doesn't watch this later. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was whatever, you know, I, I did what I had to do, but, um, mostly though, they're going to be able to work off the digital. So we are send, servicing the digital to like the vast majority. And then we're sending CDs to about, you know, a, a 20% of those people. Great. Yeah. 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 Anybody have a question? Well, I was going to, I just didn't want to uh, keep asking questions, but. No, please. Uh, <laughs> please. Uh, uh, so at what point, this is kind of um, a little bit of we what we talked about initially yeah. in our email back and forth. Um, at what point do you suggest that people try to promote their own records before they go to an actual public, like a promoter rather? Good question. You know, it's, um. I think it all comes down to why you want to hire a publicist. You know, anytime I have someone come to me, I, I like to have 
at least a phone conversation with them. Um, I, I mean, I've spoken on the phone with all my clients, I've, there, it, which I thought was the norm, but other publicists tell me there are some that they've like never spoken, they've like never spoken to their clients or like they've never met them. I mean, that is fine, I guess, if that's how you want to do it. But personally, like I want to be able to speak with them because I want to know what your goals are. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to kind of know like what, what you want to get out of it. You know, are you trying to get, you know, do you want to get a feature in Downbeat? Do you, are you trying to get plays, you know, plays on Spotify? Like, are you trying to ramp up your social media? I mean, there's all different reasons why people think they need a publicist. Mm -hmm. And what I do is when I am speaking with people about what they want, I kind of evaluate, like, do you, do you, do you need a publicist? If it's really, you know, just to get the project, you have the project and you want to get it out there and you want people to hear it, you know, like, we all want that. But it's like, and, and what else, you know, are you trying to reach, is there a market that you're trying to reach? Are you like, maybe you're doing a project that's kind of like on the freer side and you want to make sure that you can get it to the right, to people that write about free jazz or that's their specialty, which, you know, as we know, there's obviously not that many that do that. So a publicist conceivably would, would know, you know, who would be the best person for that project. Now, if it's more like, you know, you've got a standards record and it's super accessible and, you know, it's an easy, kind of an easy sell. And, um, you know, you just want to, again, just get it out there and maybe you, you know, haven't released anything before, maybe you don't have a great social media presence, or maybe you don't have, you know, shows lined up in your former life. Um, and you don't have, you know, these things in order, it might make sense for you to do it on your own, you know, to start doing it yourself, um, to at least lay the foundation. And then a publicist can step in and, you know, on the next one, um, to do a better job. It really just comes down to what you want to do, what your priorities are. Um, because you know, it's, um, uh, it's different for everyone. It's different for everybody. Um, the biggest thing for me that I see a lot is when people come to me and I feel like they're not ready for a publicist or not, I feel like saying not ready is like so lame. I mean, they're not, they're not ready for a publicist, but that it's not the best investment is if it's their debut and, um, they haven't been playing out a lot because, mm -hmm. Basically what happens is a lot of these critics and reviewers and journalists are going to look at a project and kind of do the name recognition. Um, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 that piano player. Oh, yeah, he plays with so-and-so. Or, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, 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 I heard him on this one. Or, oh, yeah, he has that steady gig, you know, that I've, I've heard over at Smalls or whatever. That, these little things all kind of count when you're putting together a project. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes to me and they're just out of school or they're just kind of like, you know, getting their feet wet, or maybe their parents want to pay for it, which I've had plenty of times, you know, where they're like, I'll pay for my daughter's PR, for you know, and, and that's fine, but you're definitely not going to get the same results um, it, that you would if you had maybe, you know, done the work on your own first. So it's all about laying the groundwork. Um, and then there are some people that have the bread and they figure, I have the money, I don't, you know, I want to just do it right the first time. Let me just hire a publicist and I'll be like, you do know, like it's going to be very hard to get stuff for this. Mm -hmm. And most of the time they understand that. So it just depends on, you know, on what, um, on what your goals are. And it also depends on like the market, you know, like if, if someone comes to me and I have already like a bunch of vocal projects, I can't take another one or something like that. Um, in which case I might suggest, you know, maybe this is something you could do on your own. It just depends on the project. Would you would you suggest uh, as far as somebody who is just putting out their first record or somebody who's uh, not as well known yet to maybe wait until the pandemic is over or to to start looking into those things and be patient or to just go for it and do it on your own? I think that we don't know how this pandemic is going to play out. And I've been very hesitant to say, see, this is why I encourage my artists to keep their dates when this all started, because I didn't, I don't have an end date. I'm sorry, my neighbor's like yelling at his kids. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, it's like super loud. I don't know what the hell's going on out there. Okay, sorry. Um, I keep saying to people um, that we, we don't know when this is going to be over. So for me to tell you to wait, I could tell you to wait, but until when? Like, yeah. we have no idea when this is going to get better. So my suggestion is to just go for it and to, you know, move ahead and go forward and just do your thing because we have no idea when it's going to be done. That's and right. this is the predicament that I had, you know, that I was facing, especially in the beginning of all this, when I spent, you know, seven hours on the phone every day with every conceivable person I work with, where they were all asking, what do we do? What do we do? And it's like, I don't have a crystal ball. So let's just go with it. 
you know, <laughs> let's, let's, let's release it and let's, we'll take the, you know, the challenges as they come. A perfect example is this past week or at least past two weeks, you know, so COVID started to chill out, right? I mean, in the, you know, it's not, it's, don't go out without a mask, but like it's, you know, it's starting to kind of calm down with the, with the um, hysteria. So um, we're all like, okay, good. Things are calming down. You know, things might return to normal, whatever. And then we have, uh, you know, the, the civil unrest that's been going on and the protests right. and, you know, the George Floyd and all this stuff. And now, and that just like, you know, that was the focus. So suddenly everything that we had planned to do, you know, the last couple of weeks got completely, you know, John Dabble came out like the day that this all happened. And we were like, oh my God, like, what do we even do this week? You know, like, like, you know, his, his project is actually a, a very timely project because it's based on, you know, LGBT pride and all this stuff. Which we're uh, beautiful. On. Yeah. But like, <laughs> you know, no offense to John, but it's like, I'm not sure if people want to hear from like a, you know, a middle-aged white guy right now, you know? So <laughs> we had to kind of like, I mean, it's the truth. So we It's honest to, and true. Yeah. And it's reality. And also because we, there are other voices that we want to have that may, that should be heard. That's, that's a fact. You know, and I know that, and I, we all know that, you know, and so what we had to do is be really, you know, wise in how we want to go about that and adjust that accordingly and, you know, be like, and thankfully, you know, John is amazing and understands this, um, but we had to, we had to really look at it and be like, okay, so we're going to take a step off of, a step back of promoting this week, even though it's coming out this week, because we need to let these other um, issues be at the forefront. And that's, you know, what we did. And he ends up getting, you know, some really great press the next week and it worked out, but you've got to be flexible and be really, you know, open, open line. We are in a really strange world right now where things could happen. Like, you know, things are weird every day. We don't know. Yeah. What's uh, just, just, oh yes. Mark, you have a question and then dad, you can go for it. Uh, just for context. Uh, I'm not a player, but I do a lot of volunteer work administratively in the Toronto uh, jazz scene, festivals, organizations, things of, of the sort. Yeah. Uh, just interested in, in knowing, um, uh, Lydia, if you see the game changing at all uh, relative to the proliferation of new talent that's coming onto the scene. You do a lot of work in the UK and you're playing, uh, you know, Lakeisha is an example as well. Is, is, the, uh, is your work changing at all relative to who your target audience is in, in order to generate a younger Hopefully, a younger uh, jazz audience through these through these new uh, talented people. Good question. You know, something that I have um, observed is that you know the the generation even below me. So I'm a millennial, I guess. I guess Gen Z is below me, or whoever is under me. You know, I feel that younger uh, listeners. Um, to seem to be really open to a lot of different like like they're open to a lot of different genres and i think that when you look at the artists that are popular now you can see that there's a lot of cross between what kind of music can be considered um you know off the top of my head um you know i, I know this because i was revisiting her album but like kelsey Liu, you know for example is a cellist i'm not sure if, who's, if anyone's familiar with her but it's like her music is very hard to classify. Like there's elements of R&B, there's elements of soul, there's a little bit of elements right. of jazz, you know, and this is something that's kind of, um, you can find it in a lot of very popular artists, but also in the jazz artists that we're working with. Now, Lakeisha Benjamin is interesting because Lakeisha, her most recent project is a Coltrane project. Yeah. I mean, you can't get any more jazz than that, yeah. obviously. <laughs> you know, and she's got a zillion people on it. You know, Reggie Workman, Ron Carter, George Ann Mildred, like it's incredible. Um, but Lakeisha, though, has a reputation, though, of really actually being really active in soul and funk music before this. And she towards the Gregory Porter, you know, who has the biggest reach of probably any, any jazz musician right now. Um, so when you look at somebody like Lakeisha, she's like someone who can kind of usher in a, a new listener to jazz. Yeah. Someone who loved her soul squad stuff. Now suddenly, who might not have any idea who John Coltrane is, now sees that Lakeisha Benjamin, who they know from Soul Squad, is now you know, doing a Coltrane project. That certainly opens the door. For people to be you know exposed to this um and that's something i find you know i i've been really um i've actually been really happy to see that listeners get on board um even with really out abstract stuff mm -hmm. they have an open ear um lila bialy is a good example as well so is tana alexa i mean these albums you cannot classify um they are i mean tana's album is is 
some in some parts it's like alternative in other parts it's like alt rock and you know it's jazz and other parts and world music and others and um there's something for everybody and younger would, listeners seem to really like that would you would you be reaching out to new and different vehicles in that case or yeah like- i try all the time i mean i pitch non-traditional jazz publications or non-jazz outlets right. all the time i mean i'm pitching everybody from you know Pitch, from Pitchfork and, and you know, Consequence of Sound and like yeah. those, you know, yeah. specific music outlets well, to, to, to ones that are maybe like niche publications that tend to focus on very specific sub, sub-genres. Um, just because you just don't know like what's going what's gonna to hit. Now, Catherine Russell has a single coming out tomorrow. Larry mm-hmm. Campbell produced it. It's coming out on Dot Time. Um, I pitched her. She got the premiere from Jazz Times today. But I yeah. originally, though, pitched her to American Songwriter. I pitched her to Relics. I pitched her to um, No Depression, you know, because I, I saw that there's like a little bit of like an Americana element, you know, maybe there's a way that we can yeah, be able to bridge that. Yeah. yeah. The problem is that, you know, we can't always get those publications to come on board because they see something, they see the word jazz and it like scares them. Like, oh, no, 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 we don't do jazz. But so you have to like break through that and you have to consistently keep hammering it over the head and presenting it in different ways so that they don't get scared off by the yeah. term jazz. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I personally think that those, these younger artists, I've been just very encouraged by what I've seen. Um, I've been really encouraged too when I, when, you know, the, the, the old days when we could go to concerts, um, seeing the people in the crowd. I mean, Winter Jazz Fest is a ton of young people yeah, that come out right. and seeing that is really encouraging. Right. Um, and um, I think that just blasting to your point that Micaiah, you know, McRaven's last mm-hmm. record, I mean, really like universal beings to me, like there was a, a couple of weeks where I went online and every day I was seeing something written up, okay. you know, yeah. about it. And in, in a mainstream publication, I was like, oh my God, I like what I would give to have this project. Um, Micaiah, if you're listening, but, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but that's an example of one that really did. And that's because he melded jazz, he, he melded, you know, um, drum kind of like, you know, right the right. DJ aesthetic and all that, and it worked. Yeah. No, thanks, appreciate that. I think there's a lot to good look forward to in the genre and beyond. Well, Canada especially though, you know, I've always thought that Canada has just had a very uh, forward, forward-looking forward um, uh, perspective on, on jazz and just in general, I've just always been really impressed with what, you know, I, what Canadians um, will put in, the, in prominent uh, media spots, I guess. I, I feel like it's been, um, I always have enjoyed working with, with Canada because I don't have to twist their arm <laughs> as much as I have to do with American yeah. outlets, you know, open ears. And the same goes for the UK too. It's like an opener, more open ear. Cool. Lydia, yeah. Lydia, how yeah. much, I mean, you, you, do you have to like the music to book to, to do it? I mean, that's a, you, do I have to like the music? Yeah, personal question. I mean, you get five new records in and you say, okay, I like number three, number four, not so much. I'll really help number three. I mean, how much, it's an obvious question, but how much is an influence is what your taste on what you choose to work with? The funny thing is that I, you know, I don't listen to my, when I'm like not working, I don't listen to a lot of jazz anymore. I mean, I do, but I don't, but what I mean by that is like, I listen to everything. Like I will listen to, you know, my personal tastes are extremely diverse. So I'll be listening to jazz, but I can also like, you know, in the next hour, listen to Sonic Youth and then listen to Joni Mitchell. I, people outside my door probably think I'm like, I don't know, like have problems, <laughs> you know, but, but that's just the way that I am. So my personal tastes are all over the, are definitely all over the map. Um, that being said, you know, I, there are projects that come in my, in my inbox that, um, you know, I will really love because they are so different. Like Emma Frank is someone who her project is totally not jazz. I love Emma. Oh my God. I mean, her album come back that came out last year and yeah. the one before that. Oh my God. I mean, it to me, it was my favorite release I worked and it's the most non, just the most un jazz of them. Yeah. But I just think it was so beautiful and her songwriting is so amazing. I mean, it's yeah. like, and with Aaron Parks, you know, harmonically, yeah. it's so interesting, but it's also the lyrics. It's like Joni Mitchell and Tori Amos like had a baby with, you know, like with Aaron Parks, I guess. And, and it became, and it became, I'm fine. <laughs> Again, I hope he's not listening, but you know, it was just, <laughs> It was, it's so good. So, so that being said, like, I, I have to, yes, I have to personally like what I'm hearing because if I don't like it, how am I going to be able to convince someone that they should like it too? Um, so I definitely have to at least, you know, enjoy, I don't have to love everything, but I do have to like it, um, to some degree. So I do listen to everything carefully, everything that comes in, I will, you know, I listen to at least, you know, the first half diligently, and then I'll maybe scrub through the rest 
um, depending on, you know, depending on what's required of, of me to make the decision. I mean, sometimes I'll hear the first time, I'm like, oh yes, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. Other times I have to like let myself get into it more. The thing is though, um, even projects that I don't, I'm not in love with personally, I recognize that other people of course may love them. So um, as long as I don't completely dislike it, and as long as I have a, you know, a relative, you know, relatively dig it, I can work with it. But if it had to be me in love with every single project I worked, it would be hard because, you know, that was just, it, it would be hard to do that. <laughs> They're also different. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a good question. And then the, the other thing that I also look at too, um, aside from just me liking it, is the story. And I kind of touch on this right. a bit in the, right. Right. in the interview that I did the other day. You know, to me, um, the story is in some ways even more important because there's good music every day all over the place. I mean, there's good music everywhere. Most of the stuff that I get is good music. I, I rarely do I get something from someone I'm like, this is shit. It's always good, <laughs> you know? It's always done well and it's good. But what really makes the difference to me is what is the story behind it? You know, is there a narrative? Is there um, a, connect, a personal connection? Can, I, can listeners, you know, do I think that listeners will be able to identify with it? Um, some of the projects I'm working coming out this year um, have a lot to, one of my projects is really involved with, um, you know, someone kind of coming to terms with their Jewish and Arab, um, you know, lineage. And they did this like, you know, six part suite on it. And it's a you know, kind of a classically infused jazz project and it is really heavy thematically. Um, I have another project coming out with Mamet, as you mentioned, that um, my dad is actually on as a, a soloist, you know, which is, a, you know, has all these historical references and it, you know, he, he has three different themes, three different stories that he, he, that he was inspired by these Turkish, you know, uh, Turkish historical motifs where they rose up against the enemy. I mean, it's, it's so intense, you know, I, writing that press release, I'm also like, I'm like, wow, I'm like learning something. I feel like I'm, you know, learning about, learning about it. Um, that type of, of, of stuff is really helpful because I can then go to someone like Downbeat or go to like even a broader publication and say, I have the story that's telling something else in addition to just the great music. So the story you know, is really important. Yeah, Ly Lila's, uh, Lila's uh, mm -hmm. album and, and uh, project was great for that too. It was a, a lot of it was personal, not, not global or, you know, uh, uh, cultural stories, but uh, certainly deep and from the heart and a lot of stories there, right? Personal stories, yeah, you know, those personal stories are really important for people because they, they see themselves in them. Um, and I think that's why Emma's project, you know, as I mentioned before, Emma Frank's last record, like to me, I, I love that record, um, I think too, because I like personally connected with a lot of what she's singing about. So if I am, it's like, I know that others will too. Um, so, you know, you also have to be careful with the personal stuff though, too, because you get too deep in the weeds and it, a lot of That's projects, true. I can't tell you how many projects I get where they're like, I found myself and I'm like, I am so <laughs> glad you found yourself, <laughs> but I'm not sure how many other people care, <laughs> you know, but that's the, that's the most common thing. Like I'm finding my voice. I found myself, and I understand that, but it's also like, and yes, and, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, but the story is very, is definitely very important. So what do you do about, you know, you got somebody for a couple of months and it's not really happening. Mm. I mean, <laughs> we, we know because we hear your stories here, but you, you might, you know, yeah. the cat's here, but, you know, because that's a touchy situation, obviously, it's psychology one, yeah. so, et cetera, but I mean, that, does it happen often? Or, uh, is it a reflection of, is it, is it being your job you didn't do well, or her job, or his job wasn't, you know, what's the story? Well, that's a good question too. Um, you should just be on all my interviews so you can ask these questions that are very good. Right. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you're the plant. No, you know, it's the thing about a publicist is like we can only get it in the door. Publicists cannot guarantee. This is the biggest thing that people have problems with the publicist. And this is why a lot of PR people get a bad rap. Um, publicists cannot guarantee anything. They can't guarantee anything. Like when you are paying me, I cannot guarantee that you will get a review in Downbeat. I cannot guarantee that you're going to get anything. And any publicist that does guarantee that, you have to, you know, you <laughs> wonder how, you, that's a question, that's a, a red flag that they guarantee that. I mean, you know, they could be, there are some publicists that, you know, they have arrangements with writers where they, you know, some pay, you know, advertising, I mean, there's a lot of different things. Um, I don't play like that, you know, so I don't have those hookups like that. My, I try to be genuine and do things right. Um, but our job is to get it in the door, to get it heard. 
Um, but we cannot guarantee results. Now, obviously, you have a track record of achieving results. I would not be hired if I did not get results from my clients. But that's the first thing to go in with the expectation, knowing that we can't guarantee anything. Um, but what you're hiring us to do is to present it in the best possible light and to get it to as many people as possible and to make sure that they have, you know, to make sure that your project has a fighting chance of being heard. Because Downbeat gets hundreds of CDs a, a week. You know, Nate Chin in his inbox, like, he gets like 50 emails an hour. Um, the idea, though, is that because they've built relationships with us, they may trust more what I'm sending them as opposed to you sending it cold or another publicist maybe that they don't have as good a relationship with. That being said, there are some projects that I just love and I think they're going to do great. And maybe for one reason or another, they don't get the type of coverage that they wanted. Um, maybe the climate's not right. Maybe something else came out that overshadowed it. Who the hell knows? Maybe the writer had a fight with his wife that day and he doesn't feel like writing about, you know, jazz that morning. And he says, no, plenty of reasons why. Um, I think the biggest thing is keeping an open line of communication again. You got to keep their artists updated with what you're doing. I think for me, I try to, you know, I tell them, hey, I'm pitching this to so-and-so. Um, I'm going to try this angle. I'm going to try this. You know, I'll keep you posted on what they say. And most of the time, artists understand and are, and are cool, and they get that we are doing the best we can. Um, but if it's really not happening, I am, you know, very flexible in the sense that, like, I will give it more time in the sense that like, I'll continue to work it, you know, until it's dead. <laughs> and if the artist is going on tour, even if it wasn't like built into our, our contract or if tour support wasn't part of it, I will usually, you know, keep, keep going on the project throughout that tour to try to pick up some things along the way that maybe we didn't get the first time around. Um, within reason, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm accommodating in that way. And sometimes if I really feel like it really didn't do well, and I know, you know, the artist is independent and, you know, I, I'm also, I might give them a break, you know, on the bread, not always, but sometimes if I feel like that it's, you know, it warrants that. But um, it does happen. And some, some artists get really mad about it and they get really upset. Um, I've had a few, not many, I could count on one hand, those that were very like, that were like upset about <laughs> not getting certain things. But these are people whose expectations were unrealistic to begin with. And most of the time, if I get a vibe that someone has that, I, that's why I want to talk to them right away. Um, if I get a vibe that something's off on there, I will probably not work with them. Um, because if they're dreaming, you know, if, if their expectations are way over here right. and, I, and I see where they are in their career and I'm like, this is not going to, they're not going to be happy with anything I do, um, I will probably not take that person. <laughs> the thing of backing it up kind of, you know, until it's, you know, a dead animal. Um, it's a very famous story. And Kenny G was with Ariston, I believe it was. Uh, they gave up on him. He came out, they gave him a three, four, five month the whole thing. And somebody got the bright idea about six months later to resurrect it. Oh, wow. So uh, there is something to be said about like not, you know, not letting the pictures change. Really yeah, because the times, the times dictate too. You know, like a good example of this actually is I have a project that released in January, the end of January. It was a digital only release. Mm -hmm. And it was from an artist who had already released two projects the previous year. So we had had a little bit of new release fatigue, which is something that happens if you're an artist who's releasing a lot of works. Um, I mean, being active is great, and I think people should always be releasing new stuff. But the press can only cover what they can cover. And they can't cover you, you know, Downbeat can't cover you. If they've covered you in August, they're probably not going to be able to cover you in September. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind. Um, but this particular artist, you know, he had released a bunch of things early, um, earlier, and turn of the year and all this stuff, digital only. And it did not, it got, the write-ups it got were great. It had an amazing write-up from one publication that really got the story and got it and it was awesome. But it didn't get the wide appeal, like the wide coverage I wanted it to get. Um, the project has a lot of, you know, social undertones and um, is actually very interesting because it involves a lot of spoken word from James Baldwin and okay. things that are very topical suddenly. <laughs> so here we are now in the wake of this major civil rights uh, you know, awakening that hopefully sticks. And I'm like, oh, okay, well now let me go back to that project in January and be like, hey guys, do you remember this guy? Hmm. This, I know this might not have been relevant, you know, in the beginning of the year but like do you need something from this now and uh he actually has gotten some pickups you know like as in the last week over something that was released in january so that is kind of why you hire a publicist in the end because we are connected to your projects we know what your projects are about 
press is coming to us asking, hey, I need X, Y, Z for this. I need something for this. And for me, even if I worked with you five years ago, you know, if your project was relevant in some way and I can see it fitting into a story, I am going to give it to that journalist and say, hey, I have a list for you. Um, for the civil rights thing, I mean, I had a list, something from the Huffington Post hit me up and said, I need a list of, you know, tunes that can be applicable to this. And I gave them, gave them Vivian Sessoms, gave them Barrett Gardner, I gave them Brent Burkhead, you know, I gave them a whole list of stuff that I got. I'm like, I got plenty. And let's see what, if he publishes it. But. <laughs> yes. Hold on, I think Mark has a question. Go ahead, someone hasn't gone yet, go ahead. No, oh, my mom. Okay, mom, you go, and then Mark will go okay. again, I guess. <laughs> uh, you talk a lot about what you do as a publicist, but can you discuss the challenges you have in trying to coordinate with record companies, art directors, yeah. people that are creating the overall package for the artist? Because yes. people are all coming in with their vision of the artist, including the artist. Now, you're dealing with the artist one-on-one, -on -one, but then what happens when the record company has their own vision on where they want it to go? Can you explain the challenges of dealing with the other elements beyond the artist that you're not only marrying the artist, you're marrying the record company as well? Once again, parents coming through on a good question. All right. Are you guys in the music business at all? It's uh -huh. so um, <laughs> You guys know so much about this. Um, no, that is a great question. Um, I, as someone who works with a lot of different uh, record labels, a lot, I work with some uh, more, so, you know, since that list, because I need to update that copy, but, you know, adding to that list, you can include Dot Time Records, Rainy Days, you know, Ropa Dope. I mean, I work with a lot of them, Whirlwinds, and I'll be honest, I mean, some are better to deal with than others. Um, sometimes I, sometimes I actually wonder if the labels, and I don't mean, not the labels that I just named, because they're all great, but sometimes I look at labels and I'm like, are you trying to hurt this project? Or <laughs> like, like, are you actually trying to support this project? Like, I'm confused because they make it so difficult sometimes. <laughs> like, I've had labels that have no concept of the PR schedule and they've been doing this for years and they give me product, you know, I mean, I have a release coming this month, I, I don't have the CDs coming. It's coming out like tomorrow. Like I don't have the promos. Right. I mean, this is stuff that happens a lot and I'm like, okay, so we're, so we're here, like we're dealing with this. Um, so you're fighting with the, you know, you're fighting with the label. You can, some, in some cases, if the manager doesn't understand, you're dealing with a manager who doesn't get it. Most of the managers I work with really do. I mean, Gail Boyd, I work with her all the time. She is like a blessing, you know, she can help buffer things if I need it. And you want a manager like that who's on the case and, you know, who's going to vouch for you. But definitely, sometimes, though, um, you are really, you've got to um, really coordinate with the label, get the art. You have to be really clear from the get-go about, like, what timetable you need and what you expect from them um, and all that stuff. And um, I had a label today, today. I have a very prominent artist I work with who her album's been selling like crazy. 50 people have not received the copies that they ordered. So she asks the label, what's up? And they're like, I'm sorry, we've been so overwhelmed with everything going on. Um, you're gonna have to ask so-and-so about this. Um, we can't, you know, I, I can't. This is the head of the label. And I'm just like, what? Like your job is to ensure that these CDs are being sent to the people that purchased them. Like, why is this a thing? Um, so of course I end up like running a recon because I'm, you know, don't want these problems. Um, and that happens all the time. So. That being said, for those that are considering putting stuff out on your own or doing it with a label, I think you really need to talk to artists that have released on these labels and really ask about their experience, honestly. That's great um, advice. You have got to ask because just because someone's releasing on you know, XYZ, it is a good look, but sometimes it is such a much more of a headache than it's worth. And I think it's also worth noting, um, Brian Lynch, who I work with, you know, run the grant, won, um, nominated for two Grammys last year and won one. He releases on his own label. Ralph Peterson, his own label. Um, you know, all these artists, there's a, quite a few of them actually. I'm trying to think of other examples. I mean, Tana Alexa was on the cover of Downbeat. Mm. So I have it right here. I have 500 copies. This one. <laughs> Place it. This one, um, she released this by her on her own, by herself, you know, and she made it to the cover, you know, I mean, it, it helps to have, I mean, Antonio obviously has, you know, a lot of support with his releases, but it shows you don't need a label to do these things. Like you really don't. 
Um, it helps on it helps with playlisting. Um, for people that are concerned about getting Spotify plays and getting on playlists, it does help sometimes to have a label because they have good, you know, they have their, their heels in with distribution. So Rope It Up, for example, has a good track record of getting artists on playlists. I have one artist, Chris McCarthy, I work with, um, who's, you know, definitely up and coming. He's a rising pianist. He's great, um, but definitely still establishing a name. Rope It Up put out his record in April and he got onto one of those playlists and he got like 60,000 listeners, you know, and that made a big deal, a big difference for him. Um, John, who's here, you know, just got on a playlist, like a prominent YouTube playlist, because he's on Dot Time, who I work with a lot and love, and, you know, their distribution is great, and they made sure that he got on that playlist. So that's where the label helps, but if the, if the label says they have in-house publicity, definitely check and ask what that really <laughs> means, because I can guarantee you it's going to be one blast, and maybe like five right. promo CDs sent out, and then that's it. So you got to be really, really careful about what labels you partner with. Um, if you're making that decision and doing it on your own is fine. Yeah. Well, well, my, my question was uh, coordinated, uh, sort of coordinated as well, relative to the whole, the whole campaign, but it was more specific to social media and mm -hmm. how uh, you synergize with social media or do you sometimes have to push your artists towards more or hold them back to less or time it better or that kind of thing? Good question too. Um, so social media, you know, is a separate thing from PR. It is a separate entity. Um, there are people that are social media managers and that's all they do. Um, and for, there are some artists that really benefit from having someone doing their social media. Um, I work with Grace Kelly, you know, Grace Kelly has, I mean, I don't know, I'm sure her like follower count has gone up exponentially since I last checked. Um, but artists like that, they need someone to be consciously on, on the case because they are, they have developed a very strong rapport with, um, you know, with, uh, with, with people that follow them. Um, so for me, I don't concern myself so much with what the artist does on social media because it's not, it's really actually just not my job description. I'm too busy with doing the PR part of it. But I, as a company though, I'm very adamant about posting everything that comes in for my clients. I mean, if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, especially Facebook, I mean, I have a running list um, of every review that comes in every day. Cause we, we get press pretty much every day right. for someone. Right. And that goes on a spreadsheet and my team makes sure that that get, gets up on our, our website, that makes sure it gets on the client page for the artist and that it gets on Facebook in a very timely fashion. Um, because the reality is who is reading Downbeat besides us? <laughs> like I like I think we need to look at, like look at the situation. And I, I don't mean that disparage. No, that's a fair. That's, no, that's it's true. You know, I I, I mean it's like the jazz bubble is the bubble. We are the jazz world. We are all in it together. We're all seeing this stuff, right? But like the other the ninety nine percent rest of the world Absolutely. is not reading jazz times regularly. They're not checking. You know what? Um, you know, I mean some I guess some like Bandcamp and Pitchfork and stuff like that. They attract people, of course, who are you know casual music lovers who are interested in these things but a lot of like the jazz specific people you know we're all in that world and that's it so it's up to the artist to take the stuff that was written about them and do something because if you accumulate a lot of press and you don't post about it or write about it or, or promote it what the hell's the point it just sits there you know i mean it's we're in a different world where everything lives online so for me it's really important that when we get press that we are using it um, to help bolster that, that artist image. And, you know, the artists that post about the reviews they get, um, that post about their playlists, that post about these things are the ones that will steadily develop engagement and they will grow their audience. Um, so that's really where I stand on social media. Like a lot of the stuff that I'm doing in the end is really like, you're hiring me to give you content. For content, your right. Right, right. You know, that's kind of like the way I look at it these days. And in addition to like getting a review and downbeat and getting that, you know, that ink, I'm, you're also actually saying, hey, Lydia, I need content to post to my followers. Can you get me something? Right. I know this sounds insane, but this is kind of like the world we're in right now. Mm -hmm. and, and to that end too, I'll also say, I know we're running low on time, but one thing that is interesting is that, you know, um, on Twitter, especially, um, a lot of journalists, you know, don't have the platform or the time to write a 500 word review or, you know, a long form piece. So they'll do like a shout out. Um, I have a guy from the Atlantic who did a tweet about Lakeisha's record and Tana's record. And that like tw that one tweet, those, you know, whatever, 10, you know, words was like an amazing asset, mm. you know, and it was a tweet. 
I was, and, and now I, I mean, I've started including tweets in my press reports. I can't believe I'm doing this, <laughs> but like I am um, because it's about, yeah, it's, it's, it's everyone, you know, he's got like, you know, 40,000 uh, followers on Twitter. So yeah. that is going to reach more than, you know, our right. print review and downbeat, you know, when we're talking about the broader thing. So um, that's where I stand on social media. It is an unfortunate reality that we need to all deal with it. And um, that's why I, you know, if my, if they, if they don't have an artist page or if they don't have like an Instagram that's active, I mean, if it's someone I don't know and they come to me and they don't have those things, I'm kind of like, ooh, I don't know if I want to take no, this. No, no, for sure. These days. I'm getting up before we go. Yeah. What about radio? You don't do radio. Is I radio, do do radio. Is, is radio is going to be a separate guy who does all radio? I mean, it's, is it a, still a big deal? I mean, is, how many school, how many places? Yeah. Um, radio has its place. I mean, I come from radio, you know, I had a radio show, like I worked at Sirius Radio, I worked at PGO, like I, I love radio personally, and I, I see the value in it. There are a lot of people that listen to the radio, a lot of people that listen in their cars, there's a lot of people that like actually <coughs> rely on radio yeah. um, to get their music, and so it's just a different market. So when people say, oh my god, radio is not important, it depends, like what is important to you? You know, it's like, if you don't want to get the, you know, there are, there's a certain subset of people that listen to radio. Now, if it's not important to you to get those people, then by all means, don't invest in radio. But if you do want to reach those people that, you know, a lot of them happen to skew, tend to skew maybe a little older or, you know, tend to be people that have, um, you know, that are in their car a lot and maybe they are commuters. I mean, there's all different, different type of listeners for the radio. Um, but I think that you should do everything. And I think that radio is still a very viable source of, um, of exposure. And especially, you know, when you've got NPR affiliates or WBGO or WRTI, you know, well, they have an editorial side of their radio station where you can get like reviews or get long form things written about it so that it's not just like a radio interview that's one and done and it evaporates. Like you want to be able to use that content later. So for those outlets that do that, um, BGO is probably one of the best examples with Nate, you know, doing all the editorial stuff. Um, that is really um, helpful for us because it's basically like another piece of press. Um, I do do, yeah, go ahead, Mark. No, I was just going to say the good DJs in jazz, at least in the genre, uh, they, they, they share the story, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And Canada, see again, Canada's good on this because the CBC, you know, they, they do a lot of good, a lot of good work on, on having artists really be able to tell their stories. And, yeah. you know, they do, um, Coco, can you show up? My dog is like, he's like, it's time to eat. Um, I'm going to drop him. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Brothers on time. No, the, 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 way, the way I see radio is, 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 is is education and telling the story, right? Right, so you can. Um, at least for me, I mean, the good DJs are knowledgeable and. Um, um, but yes, they um, they really do like allow for people to tell their stories, and um, I so I'm a big proponent of radio. Um, it just depends on your goals with it, you know. Yeah. Does anybody can do we have uh, one more question? If anybody has a question. Oh, I have uh, one question. Yeah, yeah. please, Lucas. Uh, what changed since like 2010 in your work? Uh, what 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 work in 2010? It, like don't work anymore. Mm. Um, something that's been really interesting to see is that um, you know the print media is really is declining. Um, there's a lot less opportunity for coverage. Um, not just in print, but kind of, I mean, kind of across the board, I mean, there's like a general decrease in outlets, in viable outlets. Um, and that is something that has really made it a little bit different. I mean, when I started in 2010, um, I started in 2010 doing show promotion and doing show promotion then, you know, I could actually get like local coverage for stuff. I mean, I could get regional press for concerts. These days, I mean, it is very, very hard to get local and regional press for shows. I mean, I don't, and honestly, at the end of all this, when this, when we're back from this COVID stuff, I don't know what the hell's going to be left as far as publications go. But truthfully, I mean, it was much easier to get show press then. Um, and it was still hard, but it was easier. Now it's very hard. Um, so that has changed a lot. Also, something that happened a lot, um, you know, like in the mid 2010s was you, a lot of, there were a lot of platforms like music blogs really, really were a thing. Um, a lot of music blogs like Wandering Sound, 
or Drowned in Sound, or, you know, there's a whole list of, of amazing music blogs from, you know, the early 2010s, mid 2010s um, that don't exist anymore. But those type of platforms you get premieres with, and it really made a difference to get a premiere. Like if you got a premiere, you know, a track premiere, a video premiere from one of those outlets, like yeah, OK Player even, um, and stuff like that, which is still around, but like its prominence has definitely kind of, you know, declined a little bit um, as far as readership and such. If you could get those things, it really made a difference. Um, these days, there's not as many outlets. So blogs are just not as important anymore. Everyone's just right on their Instagram. They're right on Twitter. They don't need a blog. So that has changed a lot. Um, and uh, in general, though, um, you know, I think that, I think though, in general, though, we are, we will always have something to do because publicists really just have to always be keeping their eye on what is coming next and how to, and have to adapt to that. So as I mentioned earlier about like, you know, when a journalist tweets, you know, five words about a record, I mean, that is something. And to get him to do that, you know, it's not easy to get them to do that. It's, it's the same as asking to get an album review or asking an editor to do something. So you just have to be really, um, you know, keep consistently watching and, and, and adapting as things go on. But um, it has changed. It changes a lot. And after this COVID thing, oh my goodness, it's going to be a very, 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 very different landscape, I think. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, listen, everybody, I don't want to take any more uh, time of Lydia's. We're just so grateful that you were here and that you were able to speak to us. And I'll be putting this online tomorrow. So this is really all about um, education for musicians and the music community and trying to get people to talk more about this and share information together, especially during this time when it's, it's so unknown. Yeah. Uh, so just trying to stay positive. So thank you so much, Lydia. Andrew, thank great. you. Thank yeah. you guys uh, very much for sticking, sticking through this with me. I know this is not <laughs> the most exciting of topics, but um, if you do have any, any other questions or any, anything else, uh, if anyone wants to you know, um, run anything by me or chat or whatever, um, you're always welcome to shoot me an email and um, just be prepared to have to follow up like four times um, because I am a bit slow at answering. <laughs> and your email address is? It is um, Lydia at LydiaLiebmanPromotions.com. Thank you so much. But be prepared, to, be prepared to email a few times. I don't know. You guys, you guys don't strike me as the audience that watches Sex in the City. <laughs> I don't know, but there's an episode. Okay, the last thing. There's an episode where Charlotte wants to wants to, wants to convert to Judaism, and she goes to the she goes to the rabbi's house. Like she keeps calling the rabbi, he doesn't answer, and like she keeps knocking the door, he doesn't answer, like so that she you know she can convert. And then finally, she shows up at his house, like for like seder or something, and he finally like lets her in. That's like sometimes like I inadvertently feel like that rabbi, but you gotta just like keep knocking on the door, and, like eventually. <laughs> it's just because like I literally like forget to answer, and I'm so busy. So just be prepared to be Charlotte. Is basically what I'm saying. Oh. On that note. Um, <laughs> I love that we're ending with the Sex in the City <laughs> oh, <laughs> reference. That's great. You know, Thank just, you. just, just, just. That's be everything. Great. That's amazing. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Lydia. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It means a lot. Thank you. All right. Love you all. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, guys. Bye.